roads. 13 dead, scores injured in Sultan Hamoud bus crash. No police officer or any member of the public who have been taken hostage. Tension in Turkana as militia lay claim to oil rich regions. Corrupt cops put on notice as police vetting begins tomorrow. And coming up in sports, Classic Safari Rally debuts in Athi River. KTN Weekend Prime with Yvonne Okwara. Many thanks for joining us this start of the week. It is the 24th of November, 2013. This is KTN Weekend Prime. Many thanks again for joining us. We will be having Checkpoint later on. And today we'll be talking about Kenya's foreign policy dilemma. Which way for Kenya? A lot of statements we've been hearing made by politicians in the arena. Is that the right way for Kenya to go in terms of dealing with friends or hostile nations as they are now known by some politicians? We'll be discussing this. So please do get ready to send us your feedback. You can do that on Twitter, hashtag Checkpoint. You can also send us your text messages on 22155. But let's start off with our top stories tonight. And it's another case of road carnage in the country. 13 people, including three children, died last night after a bus collided with a truck at Sultan Hamoud along the Nairobi-Mombasa Highway. The Mombasa-bound bus was carrying 59 passengers from Wingi. Sharon Mamani brings us the story. At about 11 p.m. Saturday night, at this port in Gokomi along Nairobi-Mombasa Highway, a bus carrying 59 passengers collided with this truck killing 10 people on the spot, three succumbing to injuries while receiving treatment, and 31 others were injured. He was trying to overtake another vehicle. And unfortunately, as he was overtaking, he was taking precautions of the incoming vehicle. Then it had on collision with the lorry, that is the main truck, which was carrying some powers to Nairobi. Both the driver and the turn boy of the truck died on the spot. The truck is said to have burst into flames soon after the collision. Niliangalia, nikarudi pale mbele, nikaka kwa ile kiti ya conductor ya mbele. Nikiwa pale, nikaendelea kuongea, nikasikia, sabu nikuwa naangalia makaratasi, nikasikia conductor ya kiambia ndarewa. Kwa ya rusha hii ngari, kando iroli, iko pande yeti tatu ingia. Kidoko tu, sikujua nini liendelea, mini lijikuta. Inje. Lololi ilikuwa inakuja na mwangaza ilikuwa inakimbia na sisi tulikuwa tunateremka. Vile niliona hiyo basi vile loli ilikuwa inakuja. Mimi nikaanza pika nduru. Ilikuwa inachukua laini yetu kidogo inaiba fisuri. Inakuja pandei. Sasa ndio ile ilikuwa kwa kichwa kwa kichwa lakini iko tupatia head condition ili tupatie ubavu ndio ile tuchukua nayo pande huu. Sasa tungekuwa ni kichwa yote tungekuwa tumeisha yote. The bodies of those who perished are being preserved at the Machakos District Hospital. 28 people who suffered minor injuries were treated at the Sultan Hamoud nursing home. At the Makindu Level 4 Hospital in Makueni County, Lydia Peter and her seven-month son are among eight survivors rushed to the hospital with serious injuries. She was traveling with her husband and two children for a holiday in Mombasa. Lydia has not traced her husband and daughter. <laughs> Kauliza mzee wangu wako hapi, siku muona, msijana siku muona. Sasa nika kimbizu wa hospitali. Mkutangu jiyo jana siku waona. The hospital often receives victims of road accidents with the numerous accidents on the Nairobi-Mombasa Highway. Meanwhile, there were a number of casualties when a 62-seater bus overturned on the Nairobi-Maimahi Road. There were no immediate reports of any deaths. The Ngokomi accident adds to the numerous fatal accidents realized in recent times and really adding to the growing concern of the calamity that is road carnages in the country. Sharon Momani at the Makindu Level 4 Hospital in Makueni County. 
Police have refuted reports that armed militia are holding three police camps in Turkana. The Kenya Police Service and the administration police spokespersons, however, admit that security agencies have not managed to access the troubled areas in Turkana South following resistance by more than 200 armed youths. Local leaders from Pokot and Turkana have embarked on a series of consultative meetings to address the latest boundary dispute. Four days after armed bandits said to be from the Pokot community lay siege in Lorogon area of Trukana South, tension remains high in the area. Police say the situation is now under control, but admit the security personnel have not accessed the troubled spots. Police officers who are heading to Takwell Gorge and on reaching at the Takwell Gate, they met about 200 armed youths believed to be from Pokot community who had bulked the road. Following the barricading of the road, hundreds of residents are said to be in dire need of humanitarian assistance. The road between Kainuk, Chakwel Goji, Lorokon, and Kwamoru is closed and has been taken over by bandits. Earlier reports from Trukana had indicated the militia are holding three police camps. Police say that is not the case. The Inspector General would like to state firmly that no police officer or any member of the public who have been taken hostage. Hakuna maafisa wa defariki, hakuna maafisa wa utepa nyara, wala hakuna maafa yote mbo tumeashudia paka sasa. The siege is said to have been sparked off by a boundary dispute between the Pokot and Trukana communities, with the Pokot laying claim to an area currently occupied by members of the Trukana community. As a way of addressing this, uh, the leaders from both sides, both uh, the leaders from the Trukana county and the leaders from Pokot county, were uh, summoned and uh, they uh, willingly and uh, intelligently agreed to answer these summons. Leaders from both communities are expected to hold a series of meetings to try and address the boundary dispute. The key to unlocking that is in the hands of the leaders and secondly in the hands of the communities and thirdly in the hands of the security agencies. I said the leaders first because the leaders are the ones who will tell, the, who will tell their people that look here people we need peace. As the government grapples with the security situation in Trukana, the president's advisor on political affairs Joshua Kutuni has defended the government following claims by court that the government has failed to contain insecurity in the country. In a statement Kutuni termed the claims by court as pure propaganda by the opposition deliberately tailor-made to discredit the president and his deputy. Rita Tinina, KTN. Now the long-awaited police vetting kicks off tomorrow with the first phase targeting senior policemen. The exercise is expected to restore integrity in the police service by getting rid of corrupt and inefficient officers. It will be conducted by the Police Service Commission headed by Johnston Kavuludi. I want from the onset to say it's not a punitive exercise because there have been rumors and apprehension that uh, maybe the vetting is targeting to punish some officers, to get rid of some officers. But we must not lose focus on the fact that there is a noble reason behind the vetting, that the aim is to ensure that we uh, enhance service delivered to the people. The vetting will be done in, a, in a, as a way of uh, trying to find out what are the capacities and the competencies that our officers have how are they placed are they properly placed do we utilize each and every competency and capacity of each and every individual officer because over time people have acquired education have acquired new skills but you find that it, to an extent they are still performing duties their way they've been so one of the aim of vetting is to ensure that we observe proper placement of officers now, the Assembly of State Parties resumes on Monday, that's tomorrow at The Hague. And while the Kenyan cases at the ICC have been the center of discussion, Kenya's shifting diplomacy is also coming into focus. Will the push to defer President Uhuru Kenyatta's case cost Kenya her relationship with crucial allies? Asha Mulu reports. Another week of setbacks for Kenya. Her pursuit to have President Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputies' cases deferred from the ICC appears not to garner enough support. Despite the setbacks, the government is still pushing its agenda, so much so that the country's international relations are now coming under close scrutiny. A country's foreign. 
policy is a product of his domestic policy. This is President Uhuru Kenyatta's major headache. Which way to sway the country's interests? His predecessors all chose a subtle diplomatic approach that maintained Kenya's close ties with the West while quietly courting the East. Kenyatta's ICC dilemma has now shifted Kenya's relationship with former Western allies. The government openly censured Britain for failing to support the deferral bid when brought before the UN Security Council. Further, the president chose to snub the Commonwealth Summit in Sri Lanka and attend the Kuwait Arab Summit instead. It's important as we grow that we explore cooperation with other economies. Those in Eastern Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, and in Latin America. Concerns are however mounting over just how attainable this will be. In the year 2012, Kenya's top five exporters were Uganda, the United Kingdom, Tanzania, the Netherlands, and the USA. On the flip side, Kenya imported most products from India, China, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. This means that while Kenya is a great market for the East, it's her next door neighbors and traditional allies that have been providing market for her products. The government, however, argues that trade is not the only factor driving international relations. At the Assembly of States parties, Attorney General Githu Mwigai argued that President Kenyatta's case should be thrown out of the ICC due to Kenya's role in flushing the Al Shabaab terror group out of Somalia. <laughs> We will be telling the government how to harm it. We are very peaceful. If my training comes to Tundaka to Lime and to Lishen Gombe. We would have uh, strengthened uh, and, and, and uh, left to, to run our, our course uh, through uh, diplomatic channels. But uh, being combative and uh, issuing ultimatums and uh, is what we call vigilance. On Wednesday, the Assembly of States parties will vote on a proposed amendment seeking immunity for sitting heads of states and their deputies. While the success prospects for this proposal are diminishing, observers are keen on the next steps the government will take within diplomatic circles. Asham Wilu, KTN, Nairobi. Right, and do remember that will be the focus of our discussion on Checkpoint tonight. Kenya's foreign relations dilemma. Is Kenya becoming a bully on the international scene or are we just finding our place internationally? That all later on on Checkpoint, so keep your comments coming in. Let's move on now. The ongoing supremacy battle between the National Assembly and the Senate took center stage this weekend. Senators have dismissed a proposal by members of the National Assembly to scrap the Senate. But National Assembly Speaker Justin Justin Muturi says the MPs are not fighting devolution. Masi Kandia reports. Members of the National Assembly and the Senate are once again entangled in a power tassel just after members of the National Assembly demanded that the Senate is scrapped through a national referendum, arguing that the move will cut down on the wage bill. Some members of the Senate at the committee retaliated, saying that the move by the National Assembly will not succeed because senators were elected by Kenyans. Sasa, sisi ni watu wa Senate. Na Senate iko na watu 67 peke yake. Hapana na gari. Sasa ile nyumba ingine iko na watu 350. Mtu fanya hesabu ile kidogo tu. Kama unataka upunguze karama ya maisha, utaondoa ile yenye iko na watu wengi ama utaondolea ile iko na wachache. Kazi yetu senators ni kufanya kazi pamoja na nyinyi wananchi. Tunawakilisha serikali ya juu na chini. They were speaking at the Kenya Flow Spur Company in Elgeo Marakwet County on a forum to seek legislation on how local communities can benefit from natural resources in a particular county. At the same time, in Eldoret Town, Speaker of the Senate, Ekwe Eturo, added his voice to the matter, saying that the role of the Senate is to protect devolution. Anybody thinking that you can uh, kill the Senate is, say, is telling us you are going to kill devolution. It's telling us that we are wrong when Kenyans voted for the Constitution. 
while denying the recent allegations by the senators speaker of the national assembly justin muturi stated that the national assembly is neither fighting devolution nor is any of the houses of parliament superior <laughs> They are members of parliament. Wale wote wako pale na Robi ni wabunge. Members of parliament. There are some sitting in a house which has been christened Senate. Muturi faulted the media for what he termed as spreading propaganda that the National Assembly is fighting the devolved system of government, dispelling perceptions that the parliament is against allocation of resources to the counties. Masi Kandia KTN, Eldoret, Wasingishu County. To matters environmental now, and for over two decades, residents of Marigoini in Waidaka here in Nairobi have not had running tap water. The residents resorted to digging shallow wells to meet some of their water needs and are hopeful that their taps will run again soon. But what will it take to revive their water supply? On Echo Journal tonight, Rita Tinina reports on why experts insist that sustainable water development in cities and towns has to start with conservation of water catchment areas. Marigoine Waidaka on the outskirts of Nairobi, Wanjirongurai fetches water from her shallow well. But the water she fetches from this well does not meet her most crucial water needs. For drinking water, Wanjiro and many other residents of Marigoine turn to such water kiosks. This is the story of many residents of Marigoini, but it has not always been like this. At least it wasn't until the 80s. Since then, running tap water has remained a pipe dream. Quite literally. The rusty old taps perhaps illustrate how elusive the life saving commodity has been in Marigoini. A few years after the taps ran dry, residents found ways of trying to solve the water problem. Shallow wells are a feature in many homes in Marigoini, but there is a problem. Most of the wells have been dug near pit latrines. These wells that they rely for water supply are being polluted or contaminated by these pit latrines. While some residents depend on kiosks for water to drink and cook, for others, the seven shillings for 20 liters of water is way out of reach. Solomon Kimani depends on this well for all his water needs, including drinking, contamination issues aside. But even the wells are now not providing as much water as they used to for residents here. With the taps dry for years and with the supply from the wells dwindling by the day, one thing has remained constant for residents here. They are keeping hope alive that one day the taps will run again. Through sensitization by the Water and Livelihoods Network, the affected residents have formed a water committee. The residents of Marigoine are among the estimated 40% of Nairobi residents who do not have access to piped water. According to experts, it may not entirely be the Nairobi Water Company to blame. All the way from government policy to intervention by NGOs like ourselves and other development partners, what has been seen from a commodity end. And there has been a missing link on who cares and supports the cashment aspect of it. And for the residents of Marigoine to have their taps running again, the journey experts insist will have to start in the forests and water catchment areas.
even if you have the most efficient piping system across the whole country, but there is no source of the water. That's a, a development that will be misplaced. Nairobi gets its water mainly from two sources. The Nakaini Dam in Thika, which provides 80% of the city's water supply, and the Sasumua Dam, which accounts for about 14% of the city's water needs. Both dams largely depend on the Abadea Ranges as their catchment. The Abadeas at one time faced serious threat, but conservation efforts, including the fencing of the Abadeas, have since helped to conserve the city's water reservoir. The highlands and the forest will continue to be reservoirs for water, and therefore any development that gets to bring the water close to the people is assured of a continuous flow of the same. Until their taps run dry, many city residents give little thought to where exactly their water comes from. With degradation of catchment areas and changing weather patterns, Kenya's water sources are under pressure and it will take much more than just paying the water bills to get the taps running again. Rita Tinina, KTN. continuing series Kenya at 50 tonight we take an in-depth look at the war on tribalism 50 years after independence what ignited tribalism and have we made any strides to cure the disease here is Betty Kialo with tonight's Kenya at 50 Kenya beautiful landscapes the wildlife our sandy beaches <laughs> Diverse cultures, industrious people. 50 years on and it is evident that Kenyans have indeed fought and won many battles. However, one remains to be a thorn in our flesh, the untamed dragon of tribalism. <laughs> Before the coming of the colonialists, Kenyan tribes lived in their own distinct areas with their own cultures. Tribalism was a word that never featured in discussions and conversations because it was almost non-existent. It is only after the coming of the British colonialists that the differences of Kenyan tribes were magnified through the divide and rule principle, prompting conflicts whereby communities began to distrust and as a result, fight each other. This, according to experts, served as the beginning of negative tribal stereotypes. When the British uh, are going away in 1963 or in the early 60s, they are just about to go away, we face the challenge of uh, what kind of uh, future they are going to uh, usher us into. Immediately, you see that uh, there are two uh, major communities, the Kikuyu and the Luo, who want uh, a unitary a centrist state. They form their party, which is the Kenya African National Union, Kano. And then you have other people who think that uh, they belong to small tribes, like the Maasai, the Kalenjin, the Mejikenda, the Abaluya, the Trukana, and others, who say we are going to be dominated by the Kikuyu and the Luo, and uh, we don't want that. We would like a regionalized kind of uh, government and therefore we form our own party 44 years after independence and the impact of tribalism was like a punishment painfully felt during the post-election violence of 2007 2008 in which 1300 people lost their lives while more than 600,000 lost their homes <laughs> Many families were affected. Neighbors who once lived in harmony viewed one another differently. Husbands killed their wives. Relatives turned against those that did not share their tribe. Rosemary Njuguna, a former resident of Eldred, had to run for dear life after her neighbors turned against her husband, who was of a different tribe. <laughs> What is going on? Lakini atu kutua abruptly, tulikaka, tukana watu, they are changing kabisa, they are changing kabisa. 
ukona ya kwamba hata vile mtu ulipewa na wewe ndio unasalamia mtu na hata ukisalamia unasikia hata salamu zake ni baridi sana Rosemary says she would like to go back home where together with her husband they had built their house for their children on a 7 acre piece of land plants she ponders on every day Joyce Cheriot whose story was recently featured on KTN is another victim of the tribal clashes in 2007. Has is a painful memory of how a gang of young men from one tribe raided her home, burning her face and slaughtering her husband right before her eyes. Jamaa wakaingia kwetu langoni karibu 20. So mzee Wesley Cheriot alishikwa hapo hapo na akafunga mikono ni mwake na akaanza kukata mzee one by one hadi kutoa siri yake ndani na kukata heshima she says that as much as she has forgiven her assailants her scars are an affirmation that kenyans must never again turn against one another because of ethnicity <laughs> Tribalism has over the years infiltrated voting patterns in Kenya largely along tribal lines. The best example according to experts being the alliance of Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto from the Kikuyu and Kalenjin community whose unity saw them clinch the presidency. The people whom you see wielding and exercising political power in Kenya today whether they are in government or they are in the opposition they have arrived in those places riding on the tribal horse they have arrived there on the tribal band wagon after taking power president uhuru kenyatta made a promise to kenyans that his government will have what he described as the face of kenya and the appointment of his cabinet secretaries was his first test our first nominee an exercise that took him weeks and in the end the leaders came from different tribes something experts say was the first success of his regime now tribalism has been blamed for among other things violence corruption and underdevelopment and 50 years on after independence it still is a thorn in our flesh experts say one of the ways that this disease can be cured is if all communities are given equal opportunities to share power and resources Betty Kalo KTN Right, welcome to Checkpoint and today we are discussing Kenya's foreign dilemma. You did see that story by Asha Mulu a little earlier on talking about the fallout from the ICC and some of the statements that have been made by politicians and indeed the president and the deputy as well. And tonight on Checkpoint we have a brand new panel. Well, one is familiar, the others are not. TJ Kajwang, who's member of parliament in Nairobi here, and we have Professor Naituli and Senator Kipchumba Murkomen. Thank you gentlemen for joining us in our discussion tonight. Some of the statements that have been made recently it's a lot of chest thumping some say others say it's time Kenya puts her foot down in the international community let's start with you TJ Kajwang what do you think well Ivon um the ICC it would appear to me uh, is one of those difficult uh, discussions which we need to learn to have at some point and uh, very honestly and openly and uh, today it's good that you have brought uh, Uh, people who are professionals and Murkonen and I are lawyers <laughs> and so I want to suggest that in this discussion we will first of all want to pronounce what the law is and then we can now make interpretations and uh, political pronouncement upon the law but I'll tell you that um, I've had so many statements that have been going back and forth some of them leave me wondering where this ship called Kenya is going because uh, i kind of get the feeling as a kenyan that um, either in state house somebody is not bold enough to tell the president what he should know or if he does so then we have a president who refuses to hear completely 
But because I know that there are a lot of professionals in State House, I shudder to think on how Kenya is gravitating. Uh, because, Yvonne, foreign policy is one of those things that you open any law book in Kenya, first from the constitution down to any legislation, you meet it. Every country must be checked upon on its foreign relations, uh, foreign policy, mm -hmm. how it associates with the civilized men of other nations. And how do you think we're doing so far? We are doing very badly because uh, for a long time since independence, Kenya has been known to have allies in the West. And um, we have had relations which with not, not, it has not been easy, but um, it has kept us going. Okay. And uh, every government uh, is allowed to change policies the way they like. And I have seen uh, Uhuru's government, starting from the later part of Kibaki's government, but now properly in Uhuru government, we have been really gra gravitating from the west towards to the, the east. east, which is not bad. Okay. The only thing, Yvonne, which I want to say is uh -huh. this that a shift such as that is such a huge thing uh -huh. which cannot be discussed in state house alone it is something which must be shared on a national platform and i want to suggest that because this is uh, a national policy i want to think that uhuru's government would have made a foreign policy sessional paper and put it before the national assembly not quite the national assembly before parliament mm -hmm where there is the joint uh, Senate and Parliament to discuss the issue of changing the shift from the West to the East okay. so that it becomes a policy that all of us as a nation share. All right. And now that you've brought in, you know, both houses of Parliament, we'll get to you, Professor, in a moment. What are your thoughts? There have been some statements that have been made, uh, <laughs> including by yourself, that, you know, seem like... It, it's a bully. Of course, this is in reaction to what happened at the UN Security Council. And the big question that everybody asks is, was the West obliged to vote in favor of Kenya? Um, first of all, let me say that uh, Kenya is at its best uh, at the moment in terms of exerting its international presence. Uh, there's never been a time that Kenyans mobilized the whole of Africa to a particular decision like this. But even uh, then, you don't have the support of all of Africa. Well, uh, at the Assembly of State AU, Parties, I, I Tanzania in, uh, has been a bit. Yeah, Tanzania yeah. is. Uh, I, I really doubt that uh, ultimately Tanzania will break away. But you can count maybe even five countries to imagine because I was in AU two times with the president, and uh, the manner in which even African countries came in a short notice to come and discuss the Kenyan situation to have a conference for only Kenya situation with over 40 presidents. It means for the first time since Joma Kenyatta and uh, Kwame Nkrumah and the others in 1963 came up with AOAU, this is another opportunity for Africa f to listen to Kenya and it has demonstrated that we have maximum and high respect by African countries. Sir. And two, mm -hmm. and, and, and I want you to, to follow this too, is that uh, for the first time we have uh, refused to remain in the back room mm -hmm. and we for the first time kenyans are speaking publicly let me say this when kenyans voted for Uru ruto the the vote itself was a defiance of a position taken by foreign countries we saw uh, ambassadors like uh, the ambassador of britain telling us that they required they will only have essential contact with kenya so basically if there is any uh, approach towards imp uh, implementation of that essential contact mm -hmm. britain should not blame us because right. really okay. what we have uh, we, we we when kenyans voted for uru and ruto they were actually making a statement on foreign policy that we and are ready we are to facing, defy uh -huh. every order, every scheme, uh -huh. every position that was taken publicly. Uh -huh. It's only in Kenya, mm -hmm. actually, in the, and, and I have never seen, I stayed in Washington for a year, I went through these diplomatic circles, lobbying and so forth. I never saw a situation where a foreign country, even like Kenya, would pronounce itself in elections in America. Never. But it's only in Kenya where Americans, British, and all those kind of... TJ Kajuan will tell you international, public international law, all countries are equal, including Vanuatu. The treatment of every sovereign state is the same. And the principle of international law, and I want to be very clear on this, is the principle of reciprocity. 
every country will treat the other neighbor okay. in the manner in which they All are right. So in light of that, yeah. then the West should have voted in favor of Kenya? They should have, they just have kept, no, they should have kept, oh, you're saying about the UN yes. Uh, decision. Yes, because well, all of this sort of the stems from that, that The it? fact that I, I am not so much into the question of whether they should have voted for Kenya or not, but the fact that they did not vote for Kenya, they, I mean, they never made a decision, either mm -hmm. even to vote otherwise. You saw the wishy-washiness. But secondly, the pretense that they were giving that they are, they are supporting Kenya, they support sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Countries like America, who are not even members of ICC, really. But they're what members reason? of the UN Security what, what Council. Yes, that's what I'm saying. What reason, yes. what reason did they have not to vote for Kenya if they don't believe in ICC? There are also other African countries uh, that are not ICC uh, member states and were present. So what role do they but, have but in voting African on the ICC? But all African countries voted for us. Well, well, and, and even lastly, those, even let, those let, me, uh, let me add the last statement about the same. Mm -hmm is that uh, when you think about UNESCO Security Council, anyone of course who has studied public international law or, or international politics, will be that uh, the worst form of democracy is the UN Security Council, where a decision by over 100, uh, 8, 8, 180 countries mm -hmm. is uh, vetoed by five countries. Uh, and, and you have to go back to the history of why UN was formed mm -hmm. in 1945, mm -hmm. who formed okay. it, yeah. why did they reserve powers for themselves. So it is not even the best institution in terms of discussing anything okay. to do with democracy. All right, let's bring in Professor. Do you think oh. Kenya is being a bully on the world scene? No, I would like to debug one thing he said there that. Uh, all the countries are equal. I want to talk much more that they are not equal. <laughs> you, you never hear France telling us they are in an independent country. Or America saying that we are independent. We say that because we know we are not. Um, Kenya is not being a we say? We say? Well, why we shout our independence all the time? Exactly. It's because we it's know because we're, not. we're not. It's because we're not independent. That's so right. Shouting yeah. That. How, how long? When did you ever hear France saying that it's independent? Or America? Britain? America every day. Okay. <laughs> every so, every, uh, every state, okay. 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 Address, okay. Every state okay. of the nation address <laughs> has the argument that this is a United States of uh, yeah. America, yeah. an independent country. Uh, having said no, that, I don't, I don't really <laughs> think Kenya is a bully. And uh, what I see myself is a small hiccup here. Uh, we are all excited about our assertiveness, which is actually not even there, the assertiveness that we are talking about. Because we have, you know, assertiveness is seen through an impact. What you are able to generate, we haven't been able to generate anything right now. We are just talking and shouting very hard. Uh, and that means we don't have enough confidence in ourselves. Because we shouldn't be shouting at all. Uh, Kibake, the former president, he did a fantastic job here. He quietly, without making noise, shifted to where the country benefited the most. He showed the contract to the Chinese, wrote the contract, because they are cheaper than our traditional partners. Mm -hmm. I think it's clever if we continue that way. Uh, we don't have to declare enemies, because we don't need them. We don't need the enemies. Yeah, now, we don't also have to think that uh, we can't disagree with our friends. Mm -hmm. We can disagree with our friends. And we still continue being uh, being friends. So what I see is there is an over-excitation and then there is also something bordering on immaturity on our part. Uh, these people, whether they vote for us or they don't vote for us, will continue with our agenda. We will continue. Whether they support us or they don't support us, we will continue with our agenda. We need to continue with that agenda. Well, um, <coughs> let me just put my head to it. First of all, I cannot allow uh, what uh, my fr very good friend uh, Murkon and I said to go uh, without the other uh, opinion to it. Uh, Kenyans arguably voted, uh, re rebelled against the West, so to speak, as yes. he says. Yes. That vote was 50-50, if you think about it. Well, it was 51 <laughs> and 49. <laughs> now, I'm thinking that the rest of that 49 vote, huh? were also expressing an opinion. I have nothing at all with Kenyan shifting its position. But Kenyans that I represent want to know what is the for Uhuru's foreign policy. For us to know Uhuru's foreign policy, somebody said it here before, that foreign policy is a product of the domestic policy. So let us have a conversation, a national conversation, and let us agree, as Professor is making it, that things are cheaper somewhere 
or it is better to go somewhere. But let us go in a structured way in which we offer national forum conference in which we say that this is therefore our foreign okay. pro policy from now on. Professor? I, I'm rejecting the assumption that there is a shift because I have not seen shift in foreign policy. Uh, the fact that these people in the ICC, I mean in the voting, uh, mm -hmm. took place and they have and stayed, changed, yes. and uh, we don't like that, it doesn't mean we have shifted. So there is but really no... we're certainly no, talking about it but a lot. The, the, we, are, we are not close yeah. to any of those embassies. Yeah. We are still dealing with these people. No. We are still meeting no. them. <laughs> Uh, but then, the vice actually, when you talk, the when, yes, yeah. and when you do talk about embassies as well, six ambassadors, by the way, are still awaiting yeah, yeah, accreditation yeah, by yeah, the president. Yeah. Uh, France, Italy, and Germany among them. And of course, it's been due to the president's <laughs> busy schedule, so yeah. we understand, Senator. <laughs> I was just trying to say, yeah, I don't know where Professor lives, because in Kenya, if you want to know what's a foreign policy of any leader, you have to look at his first statements. So the first speech for the president during the inauguration spend more time uh, uh, saying what his foreign policy was going to be. Just go back to Uru's speech. They, they, they was offer emphasis on about Africa, about working with the African countries, and looking for friends who are willing to support us too. Uh, Kajuang said a very true statement, that if you want to know uh, through, through policy of a country, you look at the domestic policy. Mm -hmm. Our domestic policy is in the vision 2030. How we achieve that vision 2030, over time, we have been working uh, we have been working with the West, with the East, in terms of, as Professor said, the contracts mm -hmm. and so forth and so forth. So there is a, if you don't say even a shift, there is a tilt towards okay. fast Africanization. Right. And remember, our, our best uh, markets in Africa, emphasizing and deepening those ties. Two is that uh, there is the issue of now looking at the, at, at the East. But we have said it very clearly in our statement, including even in the Manifesto of Jubilee, that while uh, continuing with our traditional partners, we will also look at but different and relations. But Jubilee is not a government. That is where I have a problem. Jubilee is not a government. It is just a coalition which uh, appears to be the majority. Now, which what is the needs, majority? But well, is TJ which is, it the, is the, the majority? Which form yeah, 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 yeah. But, but the, the majority question they should are. be. Uh -huh. The question should be in a presidential system. I beg to uh -huh. disagree. In a presidential system, there is an executive, and uh, there is a legislature. I would expect that if that is be, that may be the disposition of the executive, that. Uh, that that outlook must be shared with all the arms of one, particularly the legislature. Okay, all right. And, and you know, you mentioned something interesting, Senator, where you said, uh, you know, we must continue to explore yes, other yes, avenues. Yes. But do you think some of the statements made by yourself included yeah. about the West help with this situation that we've got? We've got statements being yeah. made that uh, the, the British Army troops who are training in Laikipia can yeah. go. We've also had another statement made by a member of parliament in Jubilee that, oh, by the way, yeah. uh, KDF was going to Somalia yeah. uh, because you know a French national was, was and this yeah. had nothing to do with us forgetting yeah. the fact that we yeah. have also yeah. experienced attacks in Italy and other parts do you think though some of the statements that have been made by Jubilee politicians help in this matter because it's, well, basically some heavy it's, rhetoric. Part, it's part of the public discourse it's part of the debate and uh, you cannot delink you know Kenyans why why would terrorists target Kenyans it's not because of just Kenyan interest. You've seen over time, they started with a targeting foreign uh, 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 interest in the Kenya. So it, to a great extent, we are co-joined in the right. world. Senator, and do you think then, if policy. we cut ties with the West, yeah. that uh, no, nobody has the, the attacks will cease? No, and that, no, no. You know, Kenya will be a safe I, spot? I think it's wrong to imagine that anyone has announced that we should cut ties. So, People have said, the argument that uh, most of our uh, supporters have said is that we need to deepen relationship with friends who are willing to work with us. But when we call but certain people mean, hostile it nations... It doesn't mean to... No, hostile nations is too far. If, if you know international law, I mean, going to... I don't know why even people were discussing closing embassies, hostile nations, then and they so say that is not But hostile nations is it, a statement it, it, that it came from, from, from But if, from you have, if you have friends, we are four here, uh -huh. and one of your friends spends more time with you, he wants to assist you, I mean, you will keep the other friend for when there is need. But the friend who is you working know. with you at the moment, you deepen that And the other one you'll call you hostile, Senator? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think oh, this whole debate is missing the point completely. We have been for 50 years uh, very much aligned to the West. We actually have nothing to show for it. For those 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you walk out here in the last seven years, you can see that we have made progress in infrastructure development, but not really with the West with the East. 
Now, having said that, let, let me also say that we are making another uh, mistake. We are confusing two issues here. There is a government to government relations, mm -hmm. which is what is happening with the East. Mm -hmm. Our relations with the West is so deep mm -hmm. that it's personal, mm -hmm. it's institutional. Mm -hmm. Individual groups making ties with the Westerners, okay? Because of the long term. Now, I can tell you why I'm saying this is emotional because dismantling those deep rooted is not easy. And nobody will try it. Believe me, nobody will try it. What is happening is the politicians are over excited about this issue. The president isn't, and his deputy are not. And these two people are going to mend the relation eventually. And this ICC thing is going to pass. And eventually, we are just going to have our friends in Asia and we're also our friends in the West. Because it's very easy, very difficult to disrupt those deep rooted ties. It just cannot be done. But you, I, I told you that you are asking things, yeah. Uh, yeah. utterances that have been made, yeah. in the, and you're asking whether they really help. Uh, fortunately, Professor, I'm not one of those who are excited. <laughs> uh, my friend, maybe. Uh, but you, you witnessed, I, I saw something which was just out of the world that uh, somebody calling himself a deputy governor would yeah. go in a public uh, in a, in a <laughs> meeting that has been organized by diplomatic community mm -hmm. and uh, pretend to have some powers which he clearly doesn't have even his own governor doesn't have <laughs> then walks into an hotel and flashes out uh, mm -hmm. a diplomat a diplomat mm -hmm. i mean this is just uh, insane because in civilized nations, this fellow should be cooling his heels in some solitary confinement somewhere. Senator? Uh, about, uh, uh, well, <laughs> are, you want me to respond yes. to the... No, before even I respond to that, there are some things that uh, Professor is speaking about. We, we are discussing here diplomatic ties, but cultural uh, and yeah. other ties between yeah. African countries and other countries will continue, even individuals. By the way, Americans are not as bad as their government. They have also issues with their government. <laughs> Uh, Britain is not as bad. British people are not as bad as their government. They have issues with their government. So even us as a country, we must be able and right, have the right to express our displeasure with a government that is not willing to work with us. But that does not mean that we hate people who are white or people who come from those countries. And therefore, going to the point of uh, Kajuan, I, I found the Eldoret issue, I mean, we must co uh, mm -hmm. contextualize it. One, there has been this continuous belief that you know, in the past, people never had a problem with Western people. They believed that uh, people coming from abroad were coming for development and so forth. But since these stories of coaching witnesses came to public, everybody remained suspicious. And we must contextualize the Eldoret one because, uh -huh. and this is important, uh -huh. uh, the journalists wanted to cover the story. So they wanted to go in. Uh -huh. And they were told, you can't come to this meeting. And then there were some characters in town who are known to have certain behaviors who are sitting inside the meeting. So people became suspicious. It's at that instant that they called the, the deputy governor who came in and did what he did. And I agree with he, TJ. Yeah. I agree with TJ that they don't have the power to do that. You must be I agree, agree with me. I agree, I agree really with don't. him on tide on that because uh, they don't have power of I, I don't want to us to imagine that counties are going to require us to carry visas yes. or uh, diplomatic one, office right. where when someone comes from abroad you come and report to a governor. Mm. That's not true. Mm. It's not there. I think what Jeb not did, the deputy governor did, did it in his individual capacity, not as a representative of the county government, although you cannot delink the two anyway, but he did not do it as empowered by law. But basically, as a citizen who was concerned about but the But he did it by powers from. But uh, I, I, I don't, don't, don't agree with that. He said he was acting on instructions. Maybe by his governor, we are you not see, sure. So because that, he's, that, a, he's above by law. No, by he's helping to contextualize the problem. Yes. And this is not the correct thing. The information we have, unless he has some, he has uh, some information that we don't. So, so I have a uh, the information, information <laughs> we have is that a, a, a deputy governor walks into an, uh, in, in a meeting yes. and flashes out people. Yes. All right. Before we go into the context, let's say what does the law say? Mm -hmm. Can a deputy, can a governor, can even the president himself eh, come into where people are and a diplomat who is protected by privileges and immunities act mm -hmm. eh, mm -hmm. throws out people like that shamelessly? But I think what we want to discuss is that, um, as Professor is saying, we have just got too excited that we are going to do so many things that will hurt us and which will hurt people of Kenya who just wake up in the morning to be able to get some food mm -hmm. on the table. And actually, but but TJ, imagine in Washington DC or in London, there were some funny characters sitting in a particular room 
and uh, you know uh, some locals. Do you think they would have contained it? Are we I, calling? My point is this: eh? funny is some, characters no, is, is a term truth. that might yeah, rub some eh, people just, the wrong way. I'm just way. imagining okay. that there are some people from Africa who are who are supposed to do other work and they are busy and there is a fear of terrorism issues of. Uh, uh, I'm just imagining. And then you, you think the government will just let them go because I think the, because, they, because, because the point I want something. us to take to take yeah. home from the Eldoret incident beyond just the powers of a governor and deputy governor is that the Kenyans are a little bit more cautious now when it deals with people from the West. And particularly from that region, if you look at that context, there is a, there is a growing level of intolerance, which is not excitement. And it's something that we must go deep into it and discuss and ask ourselves, why are people who have stayed with the British for a long time feeling now intolerant to uh, officials of government from that country? We must answer that question than just to imagine and wish it out and say it's just a question of, of excitement. Yeah, but I would want to hear from Professor now mm. that I've met him here. Because, you see, there are two things which I see, Yvonne. Yeah. Number one is that uh, we have been complaining about... Um, travel advisories yes mm -hmm. and when they do their travel advisories we jump up and we are very very angry and here you are flashing out people and you expect them to tell their people that oh kenya is safe you come but uh, but you then know, when they do yes they, they flash you out you know secondly mm -hmm. uh, the, the the view of icc is that there are some communities that have become very um, so polarized that there are other people some people from some other quarters that are not wanted. My view was that that picture really helped to explain a position which is not true, that there are some places that some people are not supposed to go, which, in, in, in my view, was so unnecessary, it, uh, in, in actual fact, blew in the face of the ICC predictors. Okay, all right. Yes, <laughs> Professor, and, and while you're doing that because we're running out of time, even as you discuss that, um, let's talk about you know our traditional trade partners. And I know we have uh, a bit of a graphic to just show you uh, who we traditionally deal with. This is from Asha Mulu's story that she did a little earlier. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, is the Kenyan likely to suffer if we have a shift in our diplomacy in the persons that we trade with? If we can just take a look at that, you see that on air, who are major, yeah. uh, who we export. It, it, to uh, majorly clear, yeah. and if you notice the people we are talking about facing east mm -hmm. we import most we import and export very little, very little uh, to, to the, the east. east yes because uh, but, but our, you, our export mainly goes to our east african uh, brothers yes Saludy. And but then UK, the other one the go to UK and yes, Netherlands the and then the US. Mm -hmm. They are the exports. Mm -hmm. And we buy more from the East. Yes. This is why yes. we need to be really cautious mm -hmm. in dealing with this matter because the foreign policy it should be driven by our national interest. Mm -hmm. And our national interest, if we fail to balance, then we may actually throw to the balance in a, in a way that we may not be able to recover. Uh -huh. um, uh, I was just about to say that usually leadership is tested under pressure in difficult circumstances, like the ones we find ourselves in our country. It is extremely difficult. When our president and his deputy are facing criminal charges, it's not a nice thing. And this is why uh, decorum and decency is required when we are dealing with the foreigners, even those who don't like us. Mm -hmm. We need to be very decent in dealing with them. We know they don't like us, but we don't have to go out of our way to demonstrate that we are enemies. We need to know that and then in deal with them with the total decorum. That should is how we run respect. Professor, even as we close, should politicians be talking about diplomacy? No, no, most of should them we be should be. Should we be having members of parliament and senators here <laughs> discussing this, issues? This is why I'm saying, I said, the things we have heard from the politicians, we have actually not heard them from the president who is in the beauty. We haven't. So the politicians are reading from, in my opinion, different script. And I will surprise you, in the next three, four years, we will just go back where we have been with our development partners, whether they are from Asia or from the rest. This, what we are seeing here, we don't dispute with the time we don't dispute. Because like I said again, our ties with our friends, they are just too deep. To just go away. Okay. They want right. to go away. Okay, as we close, Senator, um, we recall, and I know you will say that, you know, because they became elected president and deputy, but uh, many would say that this is not uh, diplomacy is usually in the country's national interest. interest yeah. But many would say that this shift to the to the east and to the west is due to ICC and is due to uh, the cases facing the deputy and the president. Are they using this for their own personal interests and not necessarily for the national interest? Meaning, are we facing 
facing east just so that the president and the deputy can save themselves from the ICC? Uh, not necessarily. It's basically um, the, there is a principle in law that's called presumption of innocence. I think the issue of if, if the West dealt with the president and deputy from the presumption of innocence perspective, we would not be having. So uh, you, you the think they that think they're guilty? Are they treating yes, them with I a mean, presumption they told of innocence? Us they will do minimum, minimum contact. They told us it's in public domain. It, it, we should not make this discussion as if it started with the Kenyans. It started with the with the with the diplomats. I mean, you saw the German ambassador. You saw the British ambassador. Castle, you saw the yeah, you know, Castle, choices yeah, are being consequences. Choices, consequences and so forth. <laughs> so if we make our choices for the East, it also has consequences. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I don't want to agree with Prof that. Uh, uh, I agree with him that ties keep changing, and I, I cannot predict it will go where. Mm -hmm. Diplomacy is not permanent. I mean, it, you can start, you can have, uh, that's why if you read books, you read that uh, the diplomacy of American President X. Okay. How did he All right, Senator, Senator, I'm sorry so to this, cut this, you short, we are running out of time. Okay. And so, can, can I just, and so this, uh, just hang on one second. The question then, are they doing this to save themselves from no. the ICC? No. Uh, the so ship, this is for the country's interest. The shift is starting okay. with the president Kibaki. Okay. The shift is starting with the Kibaki. But more quietly than yes, the rest yes, of the Let me answer your question. Yes. Let me answer your question. Yes. What Very was quickly, purely a personal issue of Uhuru, Ruto, and the rest? has now become a national issue just because these people have become presidents. And what you are seeing and all these political uh, shifts that you are seeing are shifts so that uh, we maintain our political powers. They have nothing to do with what the local Manainchi wants to put on the table because if that was the case, they would have hearken to what Professor is saying. Let us see where we import from, mm -hmm. let us see where we export from, and let us see where at the end of the day we make most of our money. Okay, all right. On that note, uh, we have to end it. Thank you all for <laughs> coming and thank you so much thank you. for that. Bye -bye. It's been Checkpoint. Thank you for your comments. Let's take a short break now. We'll be back with more news. Welcome back to KTN Weekend Prime. Let's recap our top story for you tonight. It's a sad end this weekend as there's been more death on our roads. 13 people were killed, including three children, when a bus collided with a truck at Sultan Hamoud along the Nairobi-Mombasa Highway. The Mombasa-bound bus was carrying 59 passengers from Wingi. 31 passengers were injured, some of them seriously. The driver and conductor of the truck are among those who died on the spot. And more people were injured in yet another accident after a bus overturned on the Nairobi-Maimahi Road. Police in Soweto, Nyeri County, are investigating one of the most gruesome murders reported in the area. A 64-year-old man is reported to have been stabbed to death by his wife of 37 years following a heated argument. Julius Kanake's body was recovered outside his house, with neighbors claiming that it was dragged out of the bed by the assailant. The victim's family says they suspect that his wife killed him in his sleep on Saturday night. The couple's son-in-law claims he and his three children heard the two arguing after which the suspect escaped. The police have launched a manhunt for her. In the East African Kenya Airways Classic Rally continued today here in the county and Kenya was able to stage a special round in Athi River which saw Ian Duncan drop to second position after mechanical issues. Carl Tundo and Alistair Kavana were also part of the casualty teams as they were forced to struggle in the special Athi River stage. It was another dusty affair of the East Africa Classic Rally in Earth River which saw Kenyan drivers dominate the home tussle. In a special stage which fans had a chance to view the speed monsters up close, Ian Duncan suffered a mechanical problem which made him lose vital points to Stig Blomovis from Sweden 
in a Porsche 911 who cleared an overall time of 9 hours, 34 minutes and 53 seconds with Duncan coming in second in 9 hours, 35 minutes and 43 seconds. Onkarai, who partnered with teammate and Kenya National Rally Champion Balev Chaga, won the CS13 to move up to sixth overall in the toughest rally. Onkarai clocked in a Porsche 911 an overall time of 10 hours, 5 minutes and 55 seconds. Another Kenyan, David Hossi, made amends of his bad start to finish seventh in an overall time of 10 hours, 6 minutes and 15 seconds. The rally presented a tough experience to many of the debutants who have been presented with a crude reception. The last stage was very, very tough. Uh, Arusha, one of the stages was very tough as well. Uh, but our guys behaving well so far. The rally now shifts focus to Tanzania and will culminate in Mombasa on Friday. Nicholas Modimba KTN Sports Today. Afraha Stadium in Nakuru could host some of the Sakafa Senior Challenge Cup matches if Kisumu's Moi Stadium fails to beat the deadline set by Sakafa's local organizing committee. The Nakuru County government has revamped the sporting facility to the tune of 15 million shillings. With just this, the Sakafa Senior Challenge Cup seems more county governments are willing to take the advantage of the regional soccer extravaganza. Nakuru County government did renovate the 1908 build of Afraha Stadium to a total of 15 million shillings. The uplift of the sports facility may come in handy as Afraha Stadium could host some of the Sakafa Senior Challenge Cup matches if Kisumu's Moi Stadium fails to beat the deadline set by Sakafa's local organizing committee. Nasema ni asanti sana kwa governor wetu kwa kutupatia pesa ambazo ametoa na kuweza kwa wiki mbili peke yake unaweza ona hii uwanja uh, tofauti yake na nyayo stadium sasa ni kidogo sana Renovations of the Moi Stadium in Kisumu began over a year ago but external factors and vested interests among leaders in the region may see the Lake Said City miss an opportunity every county is yearning for Football Kenya Federation Chairman Sam Nyamwea Sunday afternoon visited the facility in Nakuru together with his officials Sisi tumekagua huo uwanja leo na tu, tumetosheka katika hali yetu ya eh, hali yetu ya, ya preparedness na hata kama inaweza ansa leo this jioni kila kitu iko iko tayari mataa tumetest inafanya kazi kwa hivyo vile ile michezo itaenda mpaka jioni uh, itakuwa kama mchana Afra a stadium that has a capacity of 10,000 may join other venues such as the Kenyatta Stadium in Machakos, Nyao National Stadium in Nairobi and Mombasa Municipal Stadium. The Ocean Boys of Somalia were the first national team to arrive for Sekafu on Saturday with Wanda Sudan, Uganda, Eritrea, Burundi, South Sudan arriving on Sunday. Victor Ogale, KTN Sports. Champions Kenya Police retained the National Boxing League title for the seventh consecutive year after ruling the fifth and final leg of the competition in a pulsating contest at the Madison Square Garden in Nakuru. Meanwhile, top marathoners and upcoming runners dominated this year's edition of the Tuskies Wareng Cross Country in Eldred as the event marked its eighth edition. <laughs> The policemen who had placed eight boxers in the final saw five of them win their belts to collect a total of 22 points and bag the final leg of the boxing league on their way to retain the title with 112 points to become the undisputed Kenyan boxing legends. Kenya prisons who earlier posed a big threat to the policemen finished the fifth leg runners up with 14 points followed by host Nakuru. Coast and Kenyatta National Hospital all tied on six points apiece. Kisumu and Nairobi Metropolitan tied on four points. Central had a point for administration police trade with no point. Bali Marathon champion Florence Kiplagat proved she still has a cross country mastery with unchallenged victory in the senior women's race at the Warren Tuskies cross country. Florence Kiplagat is sharpening her skills for the New Delhi half marathon due next month. Fellow marathoner Hela Kiprok would finish second while Lucy Kabu came in third. In the men's race, 10,000 meter specialist Isaac Corey displayed Grace Coast Country running after leaving the 12 kilometers from the gun to tape unchallenged. Right, we want to end our bulletin tonight with something interesting. Apparently, it's all about 
pimping Matatus. It was a rare show as Matatu staged what could be termed as a beauty show, dubbed the Nganya Awards. The event attracted Matatu operators from across the country. The awards seek to promote road safety. The competition sought the most compliant Matatu route, the best SACO, best conductor and driver. Separately, there was a blood donation for victims of road accidents and first aid demonstrations as well. We'll leave you with those pictures of Matatus being pimped. That's it for the news this Sunday. Please do have a blessed week ahead. We will see you again sometime soon. My name is Yvonne Aquara. Have a good night.